the last in a series of three LNAPL trainings titled Using LNAPL Science, the LCSM, and the LNAPL Goals to Select an LNAPL Remediation Technology. My name is Tad Beer Singh. I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. at the ITRC headquarters, and I will serve as your moderator for today. I will cover just a few points before we start, and also let you know how, we can, how you can actively participate today. This training is an introduction to the associated online guidance document noted on this slide, LNAPL Site Management, LCSM Evolution, Decision Process, and Remedial Technologies. This guidance document was produced by ITRC in 2018, and although we will be able to share a lot of information with you today, we certainly cannot uh, share all of the tools and resources available in this guidance document. So we strongly encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't already done so. We hope it'll serve as a resource for you as you are working on your environmental site. Today's training is sponsored by the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or the ITRC, and is hosted by the US EPA Cleanup Information Network, also known as CLUIN. Today's training is scheduled to be about two hours and 15 minutes. We are also recording this to be a, to this event to make it available on demand for those who were not able to make it today. Trainers will be in control of their slides as we move through today's training session. If you'd like to control your own slides, you are able to download the slides from the initial training page you were directed to today. You can also access the slides by going to the related link section, clicking on the Clue in training page, and then clicking Browse to. We want to hear from everybody today, both your questions and your feedback. You'll have an opportunity about halfway through for questions and answers, um, as well as at the end. But at any time today, you can feel free to ask your question in the Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We will try to answer as many of those questions as we can verbally during the question and answer break. If we have too many questions to answer out loud, we will ask our trainers to respond directly back to the person in writing through our Adobe Connect website. For those of you on the phone lines, if you would like to ask a question out loud, we will also give you the opportunity to ask your question during the Q&A break. And we will remind you that at that time that it is pound six to unmute. For those of you on the phone line, if you would like, uh, there, there's also an online feedback form for you to complete to let us know how the training went today. By completing this feedback form, you will be eligible to receive your certificate of completion to support your documentation of continuing education. At the end of the feedback form, you will be able to certify that you participated today. Once you do that, a certificate will be issued to you. The Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council is a program of the Environmental Council of the State. We are a state-led organization composed of over 1,000 members from state agencies, federal government, the private sector, academia, and community stakeholders. Our members participate in technical teams which produce tools, resources, and training courses such as the one that you're participating on today. If you'd like to be a part of ITRC, please visit the ITRC website or feel free to contact me directly. On our website, you can register for teams and learn more about how you can be an active member. The full ITRC disclaimer is available on the ITRC website. If you do plan to use ITRC materials, we do ask that you review that policy in detail and be sure to credit ITRC. ITRC is partially funded by the U.S. government. ITRC nor the U.S. government warranty the materials or endorse any specific products. On slide number five, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce our expert trainers. All of them have been active members of ITRC's LNAPL team over the years. Not only do they serve as volunteer trainers for ITRC, they have dedicated many hours to develop this guidance document. A special thank you to all of them for participating today. Our trainers today are Justin Meredith from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, Tom Playa from Jacob, Lloyd Dunlap from TriHydro, and Joanne Dyson from GHD and Services, Inc. If you'd like to read more about their expertise, you can access their bios at the link at the bottom of the page. You can also access it in the related links section by clicking on the Clue-In training page and then clicking Browse to. At the bottom of the training page, you can access their bios as well. So with that said, let's move on to the next slide, and I will pass it off to Justin. All right, thanks. Let me get my notes up. All right, so 
again, welcome to the three-part training here. Uh, of course, it's part three. Uh, we hope everybody took parts one and two. Um, and, and so we're going to go ahead and move pretty quickly into part three. I'm kind of going to cruise through the intro slides, so hopefully we have enough time to in, after the, in, during the training to do our knowledge checks and, and have time for questions and all of that. All right, so quick, quick, why does that keep cutting off? Um, so a quick uh, summary for one and two. Uh, so part one, uh, you know, the, is really the science behind the Elm Apple, and then part two was developing the LTSM. And, th and then as we move here into part three, we're really starting to get into selecting these remedial technologies to help achieve what goals we're looking for. Um, so really, as noted in the in the previous parts of the training, the three-part training series, should provide you with some knowledge and skills uh, that you can take back and apply either at your companies or if you're a regulator back to your states and help you help you get a better understanding of LNAPL, you know, what's going on in the subsurface, how to develop these LTSMs, and ultimately select technologies to, to clean up your site. All right, another way of looking at it, of course, this is all connected. If you didn't take part one and two, they are archived. You can go back and, and uh, you know, watch those. Or we're doing more training events throughout the year. Check the ITRC website, and you'll, you can sign back up uh, as we do it again, go through the, the three parts in order. So part one, of course, connecting the science to the management. Two, again, the conceptual site model, and then where we're at here today, with the remedial technology selection. And it's in the document. Part one is mostly section three, two, sections four and five, and today section six in the document. Another way to look at it, and this is actually in the document, figure 1-1, one -one, um, and, and this will show you part one, really the Ellen Apple science. It's just that one little box right there. That's all of part one. My, my opinion, one of the best parts, really like the science behind everything. Part two, you're developing that LCSM once, once you have a basis in understanding what's going on in the subsurface, developing the LCSM, and then taking those two to then move forward and start, you know, what, what technology do I really need here to address this, um, my LNAPL um, concerns, and, you know, and establish those goals and objectives. All right, so we had the our question up here, how many different LNAPL technologies have you applied or used at your site? Uh, looks like the vast majority, about about one to four. That's good. Got some uh, some people have seen more. So okay, good. That's great. That that kind of helps us think about how how we are going to work through the training here today. Um, the learning objectives, basically, what the LNAPL technology groups are why they were grouped that day, and how these site goals and objectives will influence the selection of a certain group, and then ultimately, you know, a technology or, or multiple technologies through a treatment train. Okay, great. Move forward here. All right, so the LNAPL tech, um, Guidance document it includes 21 different remedial technologies, and, and they really do vary in this group from pretty pretty straightforward like excavation, um, all the way to something more complex. You get you know your thermal conductive heating, um, and so this is a list of technologies we, we're including in the document. Um, some technologies we didn't include in the document. Uh, the, these you know, we're considered less intensive Ellen Apple recovery technologies. You know, these absorbent socks or manual bailing, passive skimmers, these short-term MIMI events. Um, generally, they're not considered uh, that effective to recover a significant amount of Ellen Apple. Um, however, you know, depending on your site, you know, emergency situations or your local regulations, you may have aesthetic concerns. Uh, you could very well use these on a site. We're just not covering them uh, in, in our document. Okay, so I kind of want to go ahead and jump into this a little bit, um, and we're going to cover a lot of this in more detail, especially towards the end when, when um, we, we do a uh, back and forth and sort of take you all the way through the, the, the process here with using these and selecting the, 
the technology. So there's an A-series table, um, and it, this is based on geologic factors. Then there's a B-series table. It'll give you more specific, in, you know, impacts. You know, these these nine factors for each technology. And then there's a C-series table, and it'll help determine minimum data requirements. Um, when, when looking at soil permeability and determining these elemental characteristics. These technology descriptions and guidance are written for generalized conditions. Um, so, you know, after you take what you've learned here, considering your experience in your local geology, uh, it'll, it'll actually help you, you know, look through these technologies and, and find the right one for, your, for your, your situation and making sure that you always have this confidence in your LCSM. Um, as you move forward. So we'll get into these tables more, but just wanted to kind of briefly touch on these A series, B series, and C series tables here really quick. So there's a linkage between different uh, remediation goals and the primary remediation objectives. Uh, so a saturation goal could be achieved by recovering or controlling an apple. An, an example of recovery will be, you know, some sort of pump and treat technology uh, con containment, uh, which is also a saturation-based goal, uh, is through LNAPL mass control technologies. You know, a good example usually is a slurry wall, and then you have composition or concentration goal, which, you know, could be achieved primarily through these phase change technologies that we're going to talk about. An example of that is your air sparging paired with soil vapor extraction. And then you can have these aesthetic goals, and, and they can actually include both a saturation uh, and a composition goal. Um, an example of the composition goal may be an odor-based concern, uh, maybe not necessarily a significant risk to human health, though, depending on the composition of, of the, the vapor coming off of it. So here's a big flow chart, figure 5-2 in the in the document. Um, it was really discussed in more detail in part two. Kind of wanted to hit it here and remind everybody about the LNAPL management process, your objectives, and how they become smart through these, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and ultimately timely. Um, and, and as we continue to progress through this third training and end with a case study, you, you should really start to see how we continually circle back and you define these objectives through the establishment of, of, of your matrix and remedial endpoints. And so these SMART objectives um, are important, especially in selecting a specific technology as your remedy when you finally get to that one technology that you're going to use. All right, you're going to see this come up, this um, ternary diagram in the corner. Uh, of the slides as we move forward and start getting into more and more of these technologies. Um, and, and this slide kind of shows the first cut, how you think about technologies and what they do. Um, in the guidance document, this is referred to as the primary mechanism. It's in section five of the document. Um, and it's and it, describing how the elemental remediation takes place. So in addition to this primary mechanism, most technologies They'll also act in other ways. So multiple actions of technologies can be represented by the diagram. And so the dots you'll see on the diagram um, shows where the technology fits in the remedial technology group. And, and so you can see the, you know, the dot in the mass control. If you have a mass control, mass recovery, phase change. And some technologies fit into more than one group. And you'll see an oblong shape as, as we move forward through these. So th this is figure 5-3 in the document. Um, at first, when you look at it, it's, you kind of have to get, get your mind around it, what you're looking at here. Um, so you have these, you can have a mass control and mass recovery technologies. Really, you only want to use it when your LNAPL saturation is greater than your residual. Uh, so you can see here, residual, mobile, and migrating, or saturation, and you're looking at mass recovery and mass re control technologies. Um, and, and really mass control here, it, using when you're in very high saturation conditions, and then mass recovery, you know, when it's a mobile 
saturation condi condition and, and the LNAP will is practically or practical to be recovered, it, it's still able to do some sort of pump and treat recovery, mechanical recovery of, of the product. Uh, once you start getting into these lower saturation conditions, the technologies you're really going to be looking at are these LNAP phase change technologies. You've really got a composition concern then. And, and you can use these LNAP phase change technologies, you know, when you have composition-based or saturation-based LNAP concerns over here. Um, and then looking at your technologies and the recoverability as determined by, you know, transmissivity testing. So looking at this again, um, talking about wind selecting technologies, uh, considering multiple treatment technologies or treatment trains. So for example, you may start with a mass control technology, uh, a slurry wall. And then, you know, you may have to control the migration of the LNAP and then move to a dual pump liquid extraction technology to recover mobile LNAP. Then you may move from there to air sparsity and soil vapor extraction as a phase change technology. Um, and, and then from there potentially move towards the final treatment in your technology train could be natural source zone depletion to finish off the site. And it's sort of an idealized approach. You may not actually use four different technologies um, to handle your LNAP um, concerns and then ultimately, you know, complete your goal. Uh, you want to pick a technology that would handle as many of these categories uh, at the same time, essentially. All right, so good things uh, when thinking about these treatment trains, when they're planned, you're using those smart objectives, your matrix for transition and endpoints. Know when you're done, when you're pumping and pumping and pumping. Are you just spending a lot of money? Are you, is there, are you, or are you still recovering a significant amount of LNAP, or, or, or is it time to start looking at something else? Um, orderly implementation, you know, you don't start with what you need to start with and then move down the line. Uh, bad obviously stops at unplanned. You're just throwing technologies at the problem. You know, some people, they use one technology at one site or a handful of sites one time and it worked and then all of a sudden that, that technology with that specific whatever it is, chemicals that are being used in situ, that, that's the way to do it. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's sort of ignoring all the things that you really need to put into the to the work and, you know, the science and understanding what's going on on the subsurface and developing those LTSMs through your, your investigation to really be smart about the technology that you're going to ultimately select. Um, I always say it's the right tool for the right job. You know, if you need a screwdriver, you don't go get a hammer. So LNAP aesthetic, um, these are these aesthetic concerns, odors, stains, sheens. Uh, it could be LNAP concerns that you have to take into account. The things you got to ask yourself on this is are non-risk odors or surficial stains from the LNAP a potential nuisance? You know, stakeholder perception of the occurrence of the LNAP a concern? You know, people see sheens or smell something, you know, stakeholders, that's, you know, that, that's a lot to them. Uh, and that always has to be taken into account. So. Uh, one thing to note is not all LNAP concerns are going to need remediation, and therefore not all LNAP concerns are actually going to generate LNAP remedial goals and objectives. Okay, we're going to get a little deeper into these mass control, mass recovery, and phase change technologies um, and, and kind of explain them a little bit more, and, and then Lloyd will really take it to the next level when he presents. So if you have excess saturation as a remedial goal and you're concerned about migration, you're really thinking LNAP mass control technologies need to be used. So these function as basically like the dam here, block the LNAP. So you've got LNAP pouring out of the side of a creek, creek bank into the creek, and you, you need to stop that. You know, this a lot of times these can will be like, you know, I wouldn't say emergency action technologies, but they're, you know, you can get them in place and kind of mitigate the situation anyway. So this slide 
links to concerns, goals, and objectives. Um, so an LNAPL concern here might be migration, which is your saturation-based goal, uh, which is to terminate an LNAPL body you know, migration and reduce the potential for that LNAPL migration. Um, and then you link that goal to a remediation objective, and the objective here is, will be to stop LNAPL with a physical barrier. So the migration concern can be addressed by your mass control technology. And again, just to hit it, hit it home, you're thinking barriers here. Uh, top panel, you see uncontrolled migration of LNAPL away from a point of release, super high you know, saturation. In the bottom panel, you can see the effects of the migration by putting the barrier in place. And here, you know, this document really deals with LNAPL. So the barrier here is just stopping the LNAPL and not the dissolved phase or the vapor phase that could be coming off of that, even though, you know, an LNAPL barrier will have an impact on at least in this scenario, the dissolved phase. So LNAPL mass recovery, I, re I really like this, this picture here. Um, you know, it, as a conceptual example to think about it, the vacuuming up a spill. So in this example, this guy's vacuuming up some water. Um, it's being removed from the footprint of the spill, if you will, uh, and this is mass recovery. So, you know, is this shot vac going to get all the water up? It's not. It will remove enough, basically, to keep it from spreading further. So the shot vac will recover less of the spilled water. If, let's say the floor was carpet, or you think about that as a finer grain soil, that's, you know, tighter soil instead of concrete, which you could think of as a coarser grain soil. It will be able to recover a lot more. Um, and the thing about recovery is it will allow for faster natural drying, so the life cycle of spills reduced. So, yeah, you, you know, recover, recovery is good. The more you can recover, you know, early on and get it out of there, the better, the, you know, then things like natural source zone depletion and what's happening in the subsurface, you know, those sort of things, or phase change technologies are more effective, and it takes less time to actually clean up in the end. So this slide is going to link your LNAPL concern um, with the LNAPL occurrence in a well to, to a saturation-based goal. So you're reducing LNAPL when LNAPL is above a residual, a residual range. Um, the remediation objective here is recovering LNAPL to the maximum extent practicable. This is what we you know hear all the time, MEP, you got to get it cleaned up to MEP. What that means is really ultimately you know left up to different uh, regulating authorities and bodies and how that how they decide what what that is. Um, you can you can achieve this goal by recovering basically enough L apple to reduce the L apple saturation, mobility, and gradient. Um, then this concern, goal, and objective would be addressed through yeah, your mass recovery technology group. All right. On to the last group. It's your phase change group. Um, Kind of a little example here with the coffee cup, you know, the steam coming off of it. Uh, you know, not a perfect example, but you kind of get the point. The phase is changing from a liquid to a to a gas, well, or steam at that point. But. <coughs> okay, so here an LNAPL concern is the risk of petroleum vapor intrusion overlying an LNAPL source. So this, you know, everybody vapor intrusion, LNAPL body. So this is a compositional-based goal. And remember, the other two groups are really dealing with saturation. And this is compositional-based goals. So you're looking to reduce the constituent concentrations in your soil vapor uh, or in the dissolved phase from an LNAPL source. So this, this objective would, would be to abate unacceptable vapor accumulation basically by depleting that those volatile constituents in the LNAPL, you know, getting rid of those benzene, BTEX, and things like that. So the concern, goal, and remediation objective would then be addressed basically by the phase change technology group. Okay, so how does this phase change modify the LNAPL composition? You're increasing the rate of volatilization. You're increasing the rate of dissolution. And then these vapor technologies increase that vapor gradient between the LNAPL and the native environment, which will increase that rate of volatilization out of the LNAPL, um, basically changing the LNAPL composition to a lower volatile content. So you're removing all the BTEX out of it. You're, you know, 
changing the phase of the L apple to reduce the risk associated with the VOCs that, that off gas off the L apple as it changes through those phases. Um, thing is, these technologies might leave L apple in place, but it'll you know, reduce or potentially eliminate pathways of concern like explosive vapor accumulation or inhalation of these vapors that are any good or ingestion, ingestion of dissolved compounds in groundwater um, that, you know, be in somebody's well or something like that. Okay, and this should really hit it home. There's a little glitch on this slide here. Sorry about that, but should be able to work through it real quick. Let me get my pointer. So why is the composition change important? Uh, you know, it, it's a more effective way to target constituents of concern. Um, a lot of times, the, what, what you were so concerned with from a health-based standpoint is, is often a small fraction of the total l apple body. So for example, benzene just one of many high hydrocarbons that will actually make up gasoline. Um, but in many cases, it will be, you know, the risk driving factor of what people are looking at. So using a phase change technology to reduce the benzene concentration in gasoline, here represented from basically A to C, uh, it is going to be more effective than recovering some, but not all of the bulk gasoline represented here from A to B. So you're recovering here but your benzene concentration isn't really going down. You're recovering the L-napple, but that concentration isn't going down. Here, with the phase change or composition-based concern from A to C, you can reduce that benzene concentration, even though you may be leaving L-napple you know, in, in the subsurface. So that, that's a lot of what you're seeing with that. Um, you know. The, basically, the key point here is dissolved benzene concentration will be dependent on the change in composition and, the, and that mole fraction. Uh, you know, and, and there is some research that's shown a reduction in the saturation will have little effect on this actual concentration until, you know, you've almost removed all of the l apple from the source. And you, and you may even be seeing a reduction in benzene, like, oh, yeah, I'm pumping and treating this. and the benzene concentration might be going down or you're seeing it go down, but a lot of times that's actually not due to the actual mass removal of the on apple. It's due to uh, what's happening in the subsurface and, and the breakdown um, uh, of the on apple body itself and how, how that composition is changing through time, which you'll, you'll get to hear a lot more about that with the natural source zone depletion um, when, when Tom talks about that. So let's do a quick knowledge check here. Uh, what are the three technology groups? See, see how good Justin did. All right. All right. So we got a bunch of answers. Everybody for getting into the training. A bunch of people still awake. That's always good. All right. All right. So yeah, the answer is B, the three technology groups, mass control, mass recovery, and phase change, represented by that ternary diagram and, and the dots that move, move through that. So I believe this is my last slide. And I'm going to be turning it over to Tom Palaya. He's, you know, we're going to start getting into more of these technologies. He's going to talk talk about natural source zone depletion. So Tom Palaya with Jacobs Engineering. Oh, I got technology groups overview takeaways, uh, select your remedial goals, saturation composition base, determine those objectives, select your technology from the three groups. Here's your three groups. I think most everybody got that right. So, and then sequence your technologies. You know with deployment and use, and use that treatment train. Okay, so yeah, Tom Palaya, natural source zone depletion. There we go. Take it away. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about natural source zone depletion. Um, I've do, uh, I have an initial poll here, Tad Beer, that maybe you can open up while I'm talking to the slide. 
um, just to get a sense for where our starting knowledge level is on this. Um, the reason we're kind of highlighting NSCD is because it's a little bit different than the other sort of quote technologies here. Um, it's a part of your CSM, so it's kind of a benchmark for understanding of your site, and it's also a remedial technology. Um, it's important because lots of these engineered type remedies, um, biological, physical, chemical, thermal, you know, may not always completely remediate the soils to your remedial objectives. So there are a lot of situations where NSCD is your, you know, uh, final, say, remedy or technology in the treatment train. So it's important to get to know it. And we're starting from a pretty low knowledge level. That's a little surprising, honestly. Um, NSCD has been around for a little over 10 years now. Um, and it obviously started in the literature, and then ITRC has really brought it to the forefront. Um, so let's dig in and, and learn a little bit more about this. You know, it's trying to um, stress the importance. You know, my opinion just straight out is you can't really fully develop a remedial strategy unless you know what the natural processes are doing at your site. It's kind of a benchmark. Um, and in, you know, some cases, the natural processes or NSCD is not doing enough. And that's when you start digging into all the technologies that Lloyd will talk about next. So it's an important benchmark. We've got an entire appendix in the LNAPL 3 document. Um, so check that out. It's Appendix B. And on the next series of slides, we'll have um, kind of some references in the bottom left-hand corner, I think, on the various different places you can go to find more information on the content of each slide. So let's dig into the learning objectives first. Um, first off, we're going to talk about the, the processes, the basics, um, mostly focus on biodegradation. I think you'll learn a little bit uh, more about what's happening with the NAPL, you know, specifically the source zone um, in the subsurface. It you know, this NSED, another thing to point out, is it's occurring on all of our sites. Um, so it behooves us really to understand it and incorporate it into our, into our plans. The second is um, looking at how to pull an SED into your LCSM. Um, from an initial state, um, you want to look at the natural degradation processes and the stability of the plume, uh, the, the remedy selection LCSM. So there's three different phases you, you saw in earlier trainings. Um, the initial is, is the basics on the, the science. The, the second, the remedy selection, is the phase change technology option you have with NSCD. And the third um, LCSM stage is using uh, NSCD as kind of a performance metric, so looking at your systems, how do they compare to NSCD. Uh, and then finally, you know, considering it as a remedial alternative. And um, this NSCD is applicable mostly to risk-based um, closure sites, low-threat sites, um, and long-term management. So it has um, a broad applicability for, for a lot of these types of sites, um, as well as, as others out there. But that's certainly its, um, its sweet spot. So let's talk a little bit about the science. Um, this is the new conceptualization of NSCD. <clears throat> and so quite simply here, we're talking about, let's see if I can get a pointer going. There we go. Um, your typical NAPL, you know, and it's um, a bit like an iceberg. You know, if you're t looking at the, the water table up here, most often we're seeing a lot of the NAPL mass below the water table. Certainly within that smear zone of LNAPL, you've got a core area with higher NAPL saturations, so that's where maybe your mobile NAPL exists. But throughout this entire zone, you have biological um, processes occurring, and they are creating gases. Um, and that's really the difference here, um, sort of the takeaway is that historically we've been focusing all on groundwater phase, collecting groundwater samples, doing mass budgeting calculations, so looking at the delta sort of depletions in oxygen and sulfates, you know, the electron acceptors, and then using those to quantify bio. But we missed really a huge part, which is all of these gases that are escaping through the Vado zone. And so I think that might surprise most people. Um, you know, you'll see a little bit later in the case study I've got that even at sites where this NAPL zone is actually submerged below 10 some odd feet of water, you still have these large uh, amounts of gases that are created. Uh, they, they create bubbles, and then they eventually escape through the saturated zone into the beta zone. 
And where those gases migrate, and they continue to migrate vertically upwards, where they meet the ground surface, they're actually measurable. Um, so that's the key thing here, and we'll talk about the different technologies that you can use to measure these gases that are um, emitted from the ground surface. The other aspect of this is the um, sort of collision between the oxygen and the methane. So a lot of these processes are methanogenic in the NAPL saturated zone, um, and they create copious amounts of methane. Um, that methane, just as I described, migrates vertically upwards through saturated and vedose zones. And where it actually meets oxygen coming in vertically downwards from the atmosphere, it creates this halo or this hydrocarbon oxidation zone. Um, what's unique about it is it's actually got a, high, a slightly warmer temperature. So that's an oxidation process, uh, the conversion of methane to CO2. And where that happens, the exothermic reaction warms the soils a little bit. So kind of cool. Um, some really interesting aspects of the biodegradation to you know, sort of refocus your attention on. Um, and then here's some sort of the key. There's lots of science behind it and, and lots in Appendix B of the ITRC LNAPL3 document. But just a few of the more interesting things are at this time, you know, we are observing these NSED rates. So these are sort of mass over time um, numbers, how much degradation is occurring. Um, we're observing them to not change so much over time. So we're calling them zero order. We haven't seen change over time. Now, granted, our knowledge of this technology is relatively early, sort of in its infancy. Like I said, we've really been only looking at rates for 10 or some, something years. So we'll see eventually over time if those rates start to drop um, and people are looking at new mathematical models to estimate that. Um, the other aspect is this direct biodegradation. Um, this is science that's been poked at over the years. Um, but I found this photo on the bottom of the slide here to be most um, illustrative in, in what we're describing. You know, historically or traditionally, we're talking about, you know, NAPL dissolving into the aqueous phase, and that's where the biodegradation occurs. So it's inherently mass transfer limited. Well, what we're finding out now is that these bugs, <clears throat> um, yes, they do grow in water, but they have the capability to grow um, in very, very close proximity to the NAPL. And in some cases, like in this photo here, we're seeing NAPL oil droplets inside cell walls. So this, where the red arrows are pointing to, this is the, the NAPL globule. And then this is the Pseudomonas cell um, extent here. So really you know, kind of highlights the fact that, yeah, this mass transfer limitation that we've traditionally been working with may not um, apply. And it sort of starts to explain why these NSCD rates can actually be so high. The other line of evidence that's coming in is we're seeing um, larger depletion of larger chain compounds over time. And so this, uh, this figure I just added to the slide in the upper right corner, uh, the top solid bold line is the starting oil concentrations. You know, so on the y-axis is sort of your normalized peak height from your chromatogram, uh, essentially concentration. And then on the x-axis are your carbon compounds. And so what you can see, the starting oil is in dark bold in all, at all these other locations, which are you know, s many years post-release. Um, we have lower concentrations. And the delta in the higher carbon range is actually bigger, or the depletion, let's say. So the, you know, the delta or the change or drop in concentration or peak height um, to say you know, this particular sample here at site four um, is pretty significant in the C22 range as compared to the C12. So again, you know, sort of pokes a little bit at the traditional understanding that the lower carbon number compounds go first. We're actually seeing the bigger carbon compounds go um, in some cases quicker. So how do we, so that's the science of NSCD. How do we use this? Um, we measure it. We come up with a rate. It's sort of a mass over time number. Um, and we'll go through a couple of ways that we can use this data um, for decision making. Um, the first is to assess LNAPL stability. So we like to sort of conceptualize the NAPL body as a glacier uh, migrating down the mountainside. And you know, the, the processes of melting and um, you know, freezing and thawing, for example, are very analogous to the NSCD rates. 
So you know, at the top or near the release location, um, you typically have the higher saturations, the bulk of your um, fluid. And when the release first occurred, you had, you know, let's say, um, a rate of advance of your of your glacier or your napple body that's much faster um, than the processes that are acting on it to degrade it, like evaporation and melting. But over time, as that release is stopped, and your napple body essentially re-equilibrates in the formation, you actually get this switch. So the rates of evaporation and melting actually become greater than the rates of advance, and you start to see recession in your napple body or your glacier. That's the same thing um, that we see at our petroleum sites. So for example, if you're to put a well at this leading edge, say right you know, in one of these sort of terminal type areas, you will see napple staining in the soil, but you won't see napple accumulate in a well. And so that's really good evidence of these natural processes that are occurring and helping to degrade your plumes. And it's significant. Another way you can use NSCD data is to assess practicability of recovery. Um, so, you know, you can measure the NSCD rates and um, take a look at and compare those rates to what active systems can do. And so on the right-hand side of this slide are a couple of bar charts, or is a bar chart with a few bars, um, that plot um, the range of data um, that we had in our database for skimming systems and then aeration systems. And those are the vertical bars on both early stage and later stage. So, you know, we know in general when systems are first started, they're very, very effective and removing a lot of oil. Um, but pretty soon after, namely, you know, a year or so after startup, they start sort of petering out. Um, and this kind of shows that. That's why the, the two, the early and the lates, are shown for each of the technologies. And then in the dash line that goes across the chart here, bring the pointer back, this is our median rate of NSCD. And so all I wanted to do is to, to kind of highlight with this is to, to show the point that Yes, some of these systems, and many of them, when you first start them up, they're doing better than NSCD. But there becomes a time when NSCD rates actually start to exceed what you got. And that's when you want to start looking at how practical continuation of recovery is, and even using these NSCD rates as a metric for shutdown of those systems. And then lastly, another way to use the NSCD data is as a benchmark for um, remedy design. So there are a lot of situations where, um, you know, teams or regulators are like, great, um, you know, super glad NSCD is, is doing its thing, um, but it's not enough. We still have some concerns, some risk maybe at the site. And so you can use it as a benchmark for, you know, taking that next step up in sort of energy intensity, aeration, enhanced anaerobic processes, or even thermal processes. And so when you're going in and you're starting on those up and you're operating those, you're using that NSCD rate as a benchmark to tell you whether that system is doing well or whether it's not in time maybe to, tr to transition. So that's what you do with the data. How do we get these rates? And if I had more time, we would go more into these. But I'll throw them up on the, sl on the um, slide here. Four different methods. These are all detailed in Appendix B of the LNAPL3 document. <clears throat> There's the gradient method, which relies on soil gas samples um, collected vertically in the subsurface above your NAPL smear zone. So that's typically installation of these, you know, six-inch sort of length vapor monitoring probes and using a landfill gas meter to measure CO2 uh, and O2 and even methane uh, with depth. And then you can use um, fixed law to estimate the flux of both CO2 coming out um, in a O2 consumption, and then estimate your biodegradation rates that way. A more direct way of measuring the biogases is using traps and chambers. So those are methods two and three here. Um, bring the pointer back. Um, Yep, so the traps are sitting on the ground surface. They've got absorbent material, and they are essentially capturing CO2 that's coming up vertically through the Vados zone and out of the ground surface. Shallow installation sits there for about two weeks, traps the CO2, 
After you're done with the deployment, you send that uh, cartridge, so to speak, back to the, the eFlux LLC laboratory, and then it will, uh, they will um, tell you how much carbon came out, and then also be able to use a 14C, which can then differentiate between how much of that carbon is oil-related um, versus how much of that carbon may be sort of natural organic matter. So that's a key part of these methods is making sure that you correct the values for you know any interference from natural processes that also do create CO2. So pay very close attention to that when you're measuring. And then lastly is the biogenic heat method. Um, that's used perhaps a little bit less um, than the others, but still relevant. Um, and uh, for the reason I mentioned earlier, there's an exothermic reaction where the methane and the CO2 collide. Um, and, and there's um, ample uh, mathematical um, derivations and, and ways that you can calculate um, the NSDD rate. It's a little more involved. Um, and you know, if you are considering looking at using heat, it's a good fit because you can essentially drive these thermistor strings into the ground and leave them there. And they will continuously log temperatures unattended. Um, so if we're looking at a long-term monitoring for NSCD, the biogenic heat method is something to take a close look at because it doesn't necessarily require repeated mobilizations to the site. So let's wrap it up here with a case study just to kind of demonstrate and pull all of this together, how you might apply it at your site. Um, this is a jet fuel site in California. And I mentioned earlier the submergence thing. So we were able to you know, reasonably delineate the NAPL smear zone, and, and that's shown here on the concept cross section here. If I can get my pointer back. Um, and you know, since the time of the release, there was a change in groundwater use in the area, uh, less use, obviously. And so those, the groundwater table slowly rose and actually submerged that NAPL. Uh, important thing to note, that does not cut off the efflux of gases that vent into the Vado zone here. Um, but it was an important part of the CSM that we wanted to pay attention to it in case it you know, may have some issues there. Um, various different historical remedial actions were performed, excavation in the shallow area where the pipeline release occurred, of course skimming systems, and then also an SVE system. And you can kind of see the numbers here in you know, over about 10 years of operation, they got about 10,000 gallons out with the skimming, and then about another 10,000 with the SDE system. We saw the data, the O&M data, saw the mass removal plateau occurring, and um, immediately jumped to, okay, well, we're in that transition phase, let's look at NSCD rates. So we applied the logic um, that uh, very close to what ITRC has in their guidance document to determine um, is it ready for a remedy, um, yes or no, and is NSDD an appropriate remedy for that transition. So, you know, the cool thing about these ITRC, maybe they're not so pretty to look at, but they're very helpful, um, a step-by-step -step process to walk you through, you know, the decision of, you know, determining whether it's time to initiate NSDD transition um, or not. And so that's where, you know, we spent a fair amount of time trying to, you know, make these applicable for as many site conditions as possible. And so this is just an example of, of how we did it. The key part here is kind of in the middle, where um, essentially assembling a rationale for transition is key. This is sort of your multiple lines of evidence thing. So, you know, in the environmental remediation world, no one single line of data, unfortunately, um, can get us to the decision. We've got to look at risk considerations, technical feasibility, and then also a life cycle. And then if all of those things kind of point in the same direction, i.e. Um, NSCD is the right, you know, most effective, right technology, then we're a go um, to, the, to the transition. So we did that for this site, and here's kind of what came out of it. From a risk perspective, we looked at um, the area and determined no threat of NAPL migration or dissolved phase migration, so that was our stability analysis used using historical data and, um, you know, just simple gauging data, presence, absence of an apple plume has not moved laterally. Uh, land use, um, industrial, 
and no receptors um, for the groundwater. And then, yeah, it's within a legally enforced use area. So from a risk perspective, everything was covered um, for the long-term monitoring of NSCD scenario. And then from a technical perspective, in the middle of this chart here, um, we looked at the numbers. So, you know, active remediation did its thing, but now NSCD is more effective. So our NSCD rates at the site are on the order of 1,000 gallons per year versus our recovery systems, the SVE and the, the Elm Apple Skimming combined, are only about 100 um, gallons per year. So that's a 10 times better on NSCD. Um, no brainer for the transition from a, an effectiveness perspective. Yep, did the transmissivity testing and saw that all of those numbers were super low, below the 0.1 foot, square foot per day threshold that ITRC has and you heard about in other training sessions. And then lastly, you know, that, that stability thing. So, I mean, with those sort of six lines of evidence, we didn't even really need to go through a cost analysis. Um, and, and typically, honestly, that's um, usually granted less weight uh, in the regulator's minds anyway. Um, but with all of that, um, we were able to convince the California regulatory body in this case to allow us to transition. So that was kind of a good example of, of NSCD and how you might apply it, um, certainly considering measuring it at your site. And just kind of to wrap up here, um, it occurs at most sites, um, changes in LNAPL conditions and saturation. And let's see here. Yep, and there is a poll here. Sorry, Tad Beer, running a little long. Um, just to kind of capture the, the answers here, why is it important to understand NSCD at your site? Um, and I think the, the answer is obvious <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, many methods, so pay attention to background correction and the proper fit for your site conditions. Um, and it is an effective option for these low-risk sites, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a transition remedy. It could be a remedy that you use right away, um, especially if the, the risk conditions are appropriate. And then, yeah, you know, for most sites, uh, you, I think you'll see that NSCT actually has a place there. So some good answers there, like uh, Justin was saying. Glad everybody's um, <laughs> awake and contributing. Um, I'll be glad to answer questions. I see a few came into the Q&A box here, um, and I'll try to answer those here. I'm going to hand it on over to Lloyd, and he's going to talk a little bit more, uh, actually a lot more, about all the other remedial technology options. So over to you, Lloyd. Okay, I'll go ahead and, okay, great. Well, hello, everybody. Well, as, as Justin mentioned earlier, the technologies are broadly grouped in the document on how they address LNAPL concerns. Now, we're going to use this triangular diagram that Justin mentioned to help identify how a technology can address a concern. Now, for example, so if you have LNAPL migration as your concern, then your mass control technologies are probably the first group of technologies you want to look at. And your goal could be contain LNAPL at a defined boundary. But if LNAPL saturation is your concern, then you probably want to focus on mass recovery technologies. An example goal could be abate LNAPL migration by removal of LNAPL mass. And finally, if you have an LNAPL residual or compositional effect, then you want to focus on phase change technologies. And your goal could be abate contaminants emanating from the ONAPL source. Now, the good thing is the technology groups can overlap. Now, this means that some technologies can serve within more than one group. Now, that is good because they can address several ONAPL states at one time. And the technologies that don't overlap may be used in treatment trains or a combination with other technologies to enhance or accelerate cleanup. Now, uh, as Justin mentioned, there are 21 technologies. Now, the green technologies are what has been added to this guidance document, and we're going to briefly talk about these 21. Now, here's another way to, to list the technologies within their groups. Uh, a phase change on the top, mass control on the right, and mass recovery on the lower left. And as we said, some technologies fit within more than one group. 
So an example would be phytotechnology on the right there, inactivated carbon, can fit both within a phase change and your mass control. So now we're first going to be talking about mass control technology. Now mass control technologies typically contain LNAPL at a defined boundary. Now mass control technologies are typically physical containment or even hydraulic containment. Uh, you can see some examples here that you're likely going to recognize on some of your sites. Another mass control technology is in situ soil mixing or stabilization. But other technologies that can be used as mass control are listed here also. So we're going to refer to the ternary diagram on the lower right to demonstrate what objectives are being used for each technology. And the dot here on, on the lower right indicates that the remedial objective here is MC or mass control. Now to learn more about these technologies, we're going to point you back to the guidance document, table 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and Appendix A. Now here are some example performance metrics. And performance metrics, as you know, are really important. And here are some for mass control technologies. Uh, number one, you do not detect l apple in a down cranial well, or the l apple body has stabilized. Now other really good metrics can be found in tables 5.2, and 6.3. Now here's an example how to select a technology. It's just an example. So uh, let's say you have a site where l apple is migrating toward a river. Now from the process we learned in session two, our concern can be labeled as l apple migrating into a river. Now this process is how to do this is found in tables 5.1 of the guidance document. Now our goal, the next thing there, is LNAPL saturation based. We want to stop the LNAPL migration. And then next we're going to use our remedy LCSM to review or update the LCSM. Now what might we need to know? There may be other considerations to update this LCSM that, that could influence the LNAPL conceptual site model such as, you know, you may have testing or modeling results. You may have bench scale or pilot test results. Or other factors, you may want to include cost or liability concerns. Now, more about this process is found in section 4.4. Now, if we continue with this example, our SMART objective is uh, use a physical barrier to stop the migration. That's our example. Now, as you remember, SMART is, stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And more about this can be found in Table 5.1 and Sections 5.3 and 5.6. Now, continuing, we're going to next check a technology group that provides mass control. Now, the list of technologies within mass control are typically physical containment or hydraulic containment. But other technologies here are listed. So you next align your technology with the site conditions using table 6.3. And then appendix A is going to give you more details about that technology. Now, as we continue with this example, we next go to the design and performance LCSM. We're going to design and engineer that technology to meet the goals. Then we evaluate the performance, and then we set metrics. Some smart metrics for this example could be, just for example, uh, no first l napo occurrence in a down gradient well, or no sheen detected in the river. Now, other metrics, like I mentioned, can be found in the guidance document in tables 5.2 and 6.3. And Justin and Joanne are going to outline a case study in a few minutes that will give further details on these concepts. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is specific mass recovery technology. Now, the most, uh, that's on the lower left there. Now, the most familiar technologies to you are likely uh, examples of skimming or excavation, SESR or water flooding. 
But you can see some other technologies like total liquid extraction on the lower center there are both mass recovery and mass control. Now with mass recovery, we're going to recover the LNAPL by removal of the LNAPL mass. So with mass recovery, we're going to address the saturation-based LNAPL remediation goals. Uh, these technologies recover LNAPL via either physical removal, uh, such as excavation, or, saturate, uh, or uh, LNAPL saturated soils. Or another example would be fluid recovery, like LNAPL pumping or skimming. Again, we want to use our, our SMART objectives. Some of the objectives could be recover LNAPL to a practicable limit or LNAPL transmissivity is always a good one. So here is our terrarinary diagram on the lower left. Now the dot indicates we're talking about mass recovery technologies. Now some simple uh, fluid recovery technologies or skimming like you probably have all heard of total liquid extraction. That's formerly known as dual pump liquid extraction. But also we have vacuum enhanced skimming or vacuum enhanced fluid recovery or multi-phase extraction. Now we all know what excavation is. Excavation can also remove residuals, but it is limited on the amount you can reach and the depth you can reach. And then number four, to learn more about these technologies, again, refer to table 6.1 6.2 and 6.3, and also in Appendix A. Now I'm going to give you some high-level examples of other mass recovery technologies. Now let's first talk about water flooding. Now water flooding without using hot water only increases the gradient, but hot water flooding can also reduce the viscosity. Now this is surfactant enhanced subsurface remediation, or called SESR for short, and also uh, co-solvent flushing. Now these are chemical processes. Now you can see here are the advantages and also the disadvantages in the engineering requirements. And again on the terrarinary diagram on the lower right, you can see that SESR and co-solvent flushing are both mass recovery and also phase change. MR in the PC. Now here are some examples of performance metrics. Now uh, when has a system meet or met its technological endpoint for mass recovery? So uh, other, other metrics are found in tables 5.2 and 6.3, but the three examples I have listed here are LNAPL transmissivity is low, making recovery ineffective. And also on the left there, the green line, you can use a decline curve analysis to indicate whether the system has reached its effectiveness. And the red line, this is the unit cost of incremental mass re removal. It can also be a metric. Now the cost may outweigh the benefits of the amount of LNAPL re recovered. And the graphic shows a dollars per gallon for LNAPL removed. Now, as, as we know, the, as the systems approach their endpoint, less LNAPL is recovered, while O&M costs may remain at a constant level or even increase. So this increases the cost of LNAPL removal as measured in dollars per gallon. Now, next we're going to talk about phase change technologies. Uh, we have biosparging up there on the top bioventing, NSCD that we just heard about, ISCO, enhanced anaerobic degradation, and air sparge and SVE. And as we said, some technologies fit within more than one group. An example here is vacuum enhanced skimming on the left there. It can fit within both phase change and mass recovery. And MPE is a technology that fits into all three groups. That is why it's often a successful technology. Now recall the coffee cup steam that Justin showed earlier. Now phase change technologies 
do not directly remove LNAP as do mass recovery technologies. Instead, LNAP phase change technologies change the LNAP to other phases. It does this by increasing the rates of volatilization, dissolution, and degradation of the LNAP constituents. Now, an example goal for a phase change technology might be abate the vapor concentrations in the soil, or another one might be vapor intruding into a building by depleting volatile constituents in the LNAP. Or you would reduce groundwater dissolved concentrations to a point of compliance by removing soluble constituents in the LNAP. Now, an example of this is reducing the benzene in the LNAP to reduce the benzene concentrations moving into the groundwater. Now we're going to talk about some ambient phase change technologies. Now notice the dot in the ternary is now at the top, indicating phase change, or PC. Now the ambient technologies are NSCD, air sparge, NSPE, biosparging. Uh, NPE and biotechnologies can also be a phase change technologies. So here's an example of air sparging in SVE. Now above the water table, LNAP constituents are removed through soil vapor extraction. While below the water table, air sparging removes the constituents in the LNAP. Now here are some other uh, examples of smart performance metrics for phase change technologies. For example, the, the dissolved phase concentration is stable or decreasing. The soil concentrations are stable or decreasing. Or you see an atom product performance of the recovery system. Or volatile or soluble constituents of concern are reduced to risk-based levels. So uh, other possible metrics are suggested, once again, in the tables 5.2 and 6.3. And that's well worth a table, two tables to look at. Now finally, we're going to talk about some in-situ thermal technologies. Now, these are both mass recovery and phase change technologies. Now the photo here is an example of steam or hot air injection. Now, other technologies are in-situ smoldering, uh, which is primarily a combustion process, uh, thermal conduction heating, and electrical resistance heating. Now you can find out more about these technologies in table 6.1 through 6.3, and also Appendix A. Now these are in situ heating technologies, heating technologies, but they increase the LNAP volatility and reduces the viscosity. Now for these technologies, both SVE for volatilized LNAP and hydraulic recovery are likely needed. And they are typically better in low groundwater velocity settings. OK, so here are some uh, example metrics for in-situ thermal technologies. Uh, they are similar to other technologies, like LNAP transmissivity is a good one. You can have soil concentrations or dissolved phase concentrations at regulatory standards. Well, like we discussed, you can have cost per unit volume removed uh, and asymptotic curve for mass removal. Just make sure you refer to tables 5.2 and 6.3 in the guidance document. So now we have a snapshot of the 21 technologies, their groupings, and how to select them. Now you can find more about all of these technologies in the guidance document. Now next, I think it's a Q&A session. Then we're going to turn it over to Justin Meredith of the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, and also Joanne Dyson of GHD. Thank you, Lloyd. At this time, we will open the questions and answer portion of our training. So for those of you on the phone line that are interested in asking a question, I will give you the opportunity to do that in just a moment. Remember, it's pound six to unmute your line. For anyone else, at this time, you can type your question into the Q&A pod at the bottom right corner of your screen. We will try to get through as many of those questions as we can. 
Just a reminder for those of you that are interested in receiving certificates of completion that they will be available upon the completion of the feedback form. Once you complete the form and click the box to certify that you participated, participated that certificate will be provided to you. Uh, so let's go to our phone lines. If you would like to ask a question out loud, this is your opportunity to do so. Once again, it's pound six to unmute. All right, hearing none, I will go to the questions from the pod. Um, is NFZD unaffected by seasonal temperature changes? Would you still be able to measure using the chambers in the winter in a northern climate? Yeah, this is Tom. I can try to answer that. Um, yeah, definitely. So NFZD, you know, one of the bullets I had is it's a, um, a zero order constant rate, but Within a one-year um, period, certainly at these temporal climate sites, you know, the rates will be lower in the winter um, for those NAPL source zones that are subjected, you know, somewhat shallow um, and subjected to the ambient temperature drop. Um, so, you know, for a lot of those types of sites, you'll want to measure your NSCD rates at a low temperature time of the year and then at a higher temperature time of the year to kind of figure out where the happy middle is there for your annual average. Um, we did do a test <coughs> at Jacobs um, for a site in Old Crow, Yukon uh, territories. And um, it was just an underground, pretty small underground storage tank, Arctic diesel. And we were um, out there actually in January measuring it. The field people were not happy with me. But we were, the cool thing was is we were actually able to see an expression of biogas using the chamber method, um, using the, the, the chamber ground surface um, deployment method. So even though the ground was frozen, there was snow, um, the structure of the frozen soil was permeable to biogases. So we saw, you know, in the core of the NAPL release area, NSCD was going. And um, of course, the, the total footprint shrank quite a bit, um, but it was still ongoing. So really good question. It is seasonal uh, for these temperate sites um, in areas where it's deeper, not subject to change, say in groundwater temps or closer to the equator, um, you won't see much of a change. Thanks, Tom. Uh, are there any documents the ITRC recommends for evaluating the various technologies for sites with given constraints? Uh, this is Floyd. Yes, I think that's, I'd point the person to the guidance document if they haven't looked at it already. It is uh, with uh, what uh, Justin and Joanna are going to talk about it. It is just full of examples of how to compare these technologies and to find out more about them. So I'd point them to the guidance document. All right, uh, we have time for one more question. If anyone wants to ask it from the phone lines, it's pound six to unmute. Okay, hearing none, we can move on. Uh, thanks so much for the questions and for the trainers for providing answers. We are now going to move on to the next portion of our training today. I will move on to slide 69 and pass it over to Justin and Joanne. All right, thank you. Let me get my slide up here. Um, I'll also say one thing, too, about uh, other documents is, um, so in the ITRC document, everything's cited. So that that's one of the big tricks I've used over the years of, oh, how did, how did he know that? It's because you go in the document that's cited, and then you follow the sites, and you can actually get to, you know, a journal article or other research documents or other guidance documents that that are cited in 
a document you're looking at. So that's always helpful. You can follow those threads um, if you get super interested in something. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started here. We'll take another look at, at the flow chart uh, and kind of remind us where we're at um, with this LNAP management strategy that we're presenting in the guidance document. So the, the previous two training sessions covered how to determine basically what you have and then what, you, what needs to be done. Um, now, now we're going to start making these informed decisions about the remedial technology selection and how to address it. Uh, so the objectives for this portion of the training are to learn the technology selection process and ultimately um, be able to apply the guidance from start to finish on a real site, um, which is going to incorporate all three trainings. So you went through all three of these trainings, you're hearing all these things, you're like, when do I get to pick the technology and hopefully, you know, this is where it's all going to come together. Uh, we're gonna, so we're going to start with an overview of this technology selection process. Again, the big flow chart, figure 1-1, and a lot of these things, you know, I think Tom pointed that out pretty pretty well. You know, it can, it looks kind of messy, but once you start working with it and following it, it's, a, it's like a lot of things. You start getting used to, used to it, and then it starts seeming easy, right? Once you know how to do something, oh, that's easy. It's learning how to do it that's so hard. So here we are, uh, training three. We're going to cover the topics in this portion here outlined. In the, in the flow chart diagram, and, and you'll see that we'll be using the knowledge that uh, we gained in, in parts one and two. Okay, so we're going to break this out a little bit bigger and really get into it. Here's a portion of that process flow diagram. It'll detail added uh, to show you each box in the diagram. It can represent more than one action. <clears throat> so this is figure 6-1 in the LNAPL guidance. The remedial technology selection process involves the primary screening, which screens the technologies for effectiveness. The goal of step one is to identify all possible LNAPL technologies for your site from those list of 21 technologies presented. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so in step one uses the site-specific LNAPL concerns, remedial goals, and remedial objectives along with Table 6-3 uh, to determine a subset of technologies that will fit for your site. So you'll take all of that information from the three training classes and it will come together when it's time to determine a remedial technology. So in Step 2, you're going to reevaluate the LCSM based on those lists of technologies from Step 1 and determine whether it needs updating. So this will include collecting additional data or further evaluating your goals and objectives, and then you move to Step 3. Uh, where you're going to further screen the technologies in your list based on those site-specific geologic factors and information found in the A-series table. So at the beginning of this training, I was talking about that A, B, and C-series table. Um, so we're going to get into those a lot. It's in Appendix A. Um, and this will uh, – can you guys not hear me? I've got my mic all the way up. I seem to have this issue every time. I can hear you, can you okay. Hear okay, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why it's always like this with this, but I'll try to scream into the – got a headset on, so. <laughs> All right. So uh, basically the initial screening will be followed by uh, an evaluation of the technologies in your short list uh, for basically to implement using these factors in the B-series table, which is all in Appendix A. Uh, the, yeah, the, the remaining steps evaluate the technologies for implementation using the C-series tables in Appendix A. So you want to keep in mind that at several points throughout the technology selection process, you should be able to reevaluate your LCSM and update it if necessary. Okay, so I'm going to take a minute here and talk about Appendix A. Uh, Appendix A contains three different types of tables for each technology, and those three tables are the A, the B, and the C series table. Um, so the A series table contains the general information about the technologies. It's a really great table with technologies, this general information, and the geologic conditions which these technologies are really able to be used in. Then the B series table, a list of more detailed factors um, that you'll use in evaluating the technologies for your site, and then you'll move to the C series table 
and it'll contain technical information uh, for you to consider before you implement the technology. So these tables are a really great place to start if you want to learn about a specific technology. Um, if you're just interested in a technology, you can go to these tables and learn about that technology. Um, it, it, it really is good once you get used to looking at them. Um, and, and so we're going to show you how to use the information during the remedy selection process and help narrow this list down of possible technologies. That, that was a really quick overview of what we're about to do with the case study here. So we're going to go through this case study a little a back and forth with me and Joanne um, and show you how to apply the documents to a real site and details of each of those steps. So here to help me out going to be Joanne Dyson. And you know, I'm the regulator. I'm interested in knowing more about this LNAPL site that you remediated and how you use the LNAPL process as a consultant. So if you wouldn't mind telling me about that. Hi, Justin. Um, I'd be happy to go over this project with you. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the site. So this was an active billing station with a small convenience store. And in 2000, a leak was discovered. Um, in 2000, a leak was discovered that was determined to be a piping leak from a gasoline underground storage tank. So through groundwater monitoring over several years, we knew that the water table was typically five to six feet below surface grade, um, but it did fluctuate seasonally as much as two and a half feet above and below this level. Groundwater flow was observed to be to the east and the southeast the majority of the time, but it was also observed to be to the northeast at times. So the dissolved phase contaminants of concern that were above regulatory limits were VTEX compounds, MTBE, and 1,2-dichloroethane, or 1,2-DCA. There were apartments and residences surrounding the station, and the residences uh, pretty much all have basements and sump pumps. Um, there's also an alley between the station and the apartments uh, with, the with the utility corridor. So all of this information was used to build our initial LCSM for the site. And um, if we look at the guidance document, section four discusses the evolution of the LCSM um, from the initial stages through corrective action. So for example, section 4.2 provides some, questions, some key questions to help give, uh, guide our, the development of your LCSM. Um, and the questions include um, things such as, is the source and extent of the LNAPL known? Are dissolved or vapor plumes characterized? And are exposure pathways complete? Um, so for this investigation, at this point, we knew that the source appeared to be limited to the tank basin area. And we had characterized the dissolved phase plumes. Um, the source area was likely larger at one time based on the size of the plume that's outlined in blue on this slide. Um, we knew that, this, that vapor intrusion was also a potential concern since the water table, table was typically five to six feet below surface grade. And the basements in the area are, um, can, can be as deep as six feet below surface grade. So at the time of this investigation, the um, ITRC petroleum vapor intrusion document was not, had not been developed. Um, but now this would be a good resource to use if you wanted to determine potential risks at your site. Um, so for example, based on section 3.3 of the PVI document, for our site conditions, um, based on the information in that document, we would need a vertical separation of at least five feet between the building foundation and the water table for us to say that we had an incomplete pathway with no further investigation needed in terms of the vapor intrusion. Um, obviously, at this site, the vertical separation was too small to discount vapor intrusion. So we started, started monitoring vapors below the apartment building um, and also soil gas, taking some soil gas samples uh, near the down gradient residences. Okay, so about three years after groundwater monitoring, LMAPL appeared in monitoring well MW1 with thicknesses up to a half of a foot. So with this new observation, we knew that we needed to um, go back and define the extent of LNAPL outside of the tank basin and also redevelop our LCSM um, because we had to change from our original assumptions. 
So an LAF investigation was performed to delineate the source and determine the extent of LNAPL. Um, this investigation included um, or indicated a gasoline LNAPL body around MW1 and um, to, to, uh, to the southeast towards the alley. Um, an LNAPL was indicated at a depth of approximately eight feet below surface grade was the majority of the main depth area. So after about eight years after the release had occurred, LNAPL was um, observed in the down gradient off-site well in W4 at thicknesses of up to eight feet, 0.8 feet. So we noticed that this occurred when the water table at the site had dropped three to five feet. So we went back and did an additional LIF investigation. Um, we wanted to see if we could determine if LNAPL had migrated in the past from MW1 to MW4 and was just now being exposed by the dropping water table, or if LNAPL was um, actually migrating during this current low water table condition. All right, so what we found was that the additional LAF investigation showed LNAPL, um, and it looks like it's not the, um, yeah, there's a little bit of an issue with the with how the site is looking, um, how this is looking. So MW1 should be, let's see if I can get the arrow here. MW1 is right, should be right here on this site. So here's our, um, what we could see during the second LIF investigation was that we had LNAPL along this pathway from MW1 down to MW4. And we saw that uh, by comparing the LIF logs from um, earlier logs from the first investigation to the logs during the second investigation. And then we were seeing LNAPL in places where we had not previously seen it. Um, we also noticed that um, all right, so we also knew that we had potential vapor intrusion issues um, and risks at the adjacent apartments and nearby uh, residences due to the dissolved vape contamination. But now we had um, an additional potential risk of LNAPL in basements or the stumps of these downgrading residences if this migration continued. So if we refer back to the guidance and back to section 4.2, the questions that we were thinking about before, um, we now knew that the LNAPL body was not stable at the site, but migrating to the southeast. So our LNAPL extent um, was currently unknown. All right, so a little bit more about the site. Um, this plan view shows the LNAPL plume where, um, that we determined during the LAF investigations. Um, the red indicates the most saturated area. So we're gonna look at a couple of cross sections so we can see um, how the LNAPL is distributed at the site. So we'll look at one from west to east, A to A prime. And this one cuts across that pathway from MW1 to MW4. And then the second one that we'll look at, um, B to B prime, is along that, more along that pathway. All right, so the first one, um, let's see. So again, looks like it's, um, we're seeing not rendering quite right, so I will point some things out. So here's MW1. Um, we're looking across the site from uh, west to east. So you can see the LNAPL body below the um, tank. Here's our tank basin area. Um, the high water table is actually, you can see the triangles are showing up correctly, the indications in the, um, in the, uh, pro, the monitoring wells are showing up correctly. So here's the high water table, and the low water table is, should be down here. So the red line should really be down here. So you can see that this LNAPL plume that's here um, is, um, is between the high and the low water table. So we can, um, we can see that smear zone. And again, this would be cutting across it, so it's as if the LNAPL would be coming out of the page to us. Um, so the other thing we can see in this at the site, so here, this is all the clay-rich fill at the site, and then we have a lot of sand lenses all throughout the site. The sand lenses run anywhere from four inches uh, to five feet thick, and they're located at depths 
starting around five feet below surface grade all the way down to 26 feet. All right, and then for the next cross section, so this one is along the pathway. And again, let me point some things out. So this should be monitoring well one right here in the tank basin area. And monitoring well four is here. So the, um, we can see the, the Elm apple that is along the pathway from MW1 to MW4. Um, and the high water table, you can see in MW4, here's the high water table at the time that this was created. Um, it should, the blue line should be up here. So you can see our smear zone is only part in the lower part of the water table. Um, which makes sense with the fact that this moved during the times of the lower water conditions at the site. All right. So, I mean, it looks like you developed a pretty thorough LCSM for the site. And I know the first step in the remediation selection is to determine remedial goals and those remediation objectives based on the site concerns and use those along with the 6-3 table to develop a subset of possible technologies. So the steps uses concepts that were developed in trainings one and two. And from you know a regulator perspective, it looks like there are a lot of concerns at the site involving the protection of human health and the environment. Uh, you mind taking me through the first screening step for your site? All right. So this arrow out of the way. So we did have several concerns at the site, um, which um, people are probably picking up on. So for, uh, we had mobile Elm apple that's migrating to the southeast during the periods of low water ground of the uh, low water table. Um, there's also dissolved phase contamination that's above regulatory limits. We have potential vapor intrusion issues. And then although it's not technically a concern, we had an additional factor that we had to consider, and that was that the site had um, was added to the regulatory agency's aggressive site cleanup status. So it was a priority to get the site cleaned up as quickly as we could. Having a little. Got it. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> We're skipping slides here. Okay. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Back one more. Uh, okay. There we go. So we're at the poll. So yeah, we're at our knowledge check. Uh, so which concern would you consider to be the highest priority for the site? A, migrating elm apple. B, large dissolved plume above regulatory limits. Or C, vapor plume, vapor intrusion risk off-site properties. All right, let go for another second. All right, don't, it's funny watching these, how the one gets more and then it starts influencing people switching their answers. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, this one's sort of almost a little bit of a trick question. And, uh, you know, I'll let Joanne explain for her. C won that, vapor plume, vapor intrusion risk. Um, really, she's going to talk about, you know, what was decided for their site and why. All right, so you can, Tedder, you can take the poll away. I think we're good on that. So um, as most, a lot of people commented, um, chose, the, um, if we actually had seen impacts in vapor intrusion, if we'd actually had impacts, then that probably would be our um, priority concern. But we were, um, we were monitoring vapor intrusion issues um, at the apartments and um, we did not have impacts at the time. So we decided to concentrate on migrating Elm apple as our main concern, um, knowing that in addition to the risk of Elm apple itself entering a basement or a sump, that this could also create higher dissolve phase and vapor intrusion risks at downgradient residences if that migration continues. Um, we also realized that it may be possible to address more than one concern with the right technology.
All right, so for step one of the screening process, we needed to identify a goal and objective to remediate uh, the migrating LNAPL concern. So here's a section of table 6.3 that you would find in the, in the document. Um, the columns here are, um, so we have LNAPL remedial goals, LNAPL remediation objective, technology group, potential useful LNAPL technologies, and then applicable site conditions. So the, um, the full table actually includes another column that we will um, get to later that's performance metrics. So for now, for step one, we wanted to determine an LNAPL remedial goal. Um, so the goal that corresponded to our main concern would be to terminate LNAPL body migration and reduce potential for LNAPL migration. So out of that, we had a couple of remedial uh, remediation objectives that we could consider, and we chose to abate the LNAPL body by um, LNAPL body migration by sufficient physical removal of mobile LNAPL mass. So since we're looking at physical removal, that would lead us to an LNAPL mass recovery technology. Um, and then if we look at the technologies within that category, we have um, excavation, skimming, vacuum enhanced skimming, total liquid extraction, and MPE. So these were the first five technologies that we um, considered for the site. All right, so um, even though the, the full list of geologic factors and detailed information is found in the A series table in Appendix A, that's been mentioned a couple of times. Um, this table also summarizes some of the geologic conditions here um, that we can do an initial screening at this step of the process. So these geologic factors include um, the geology, whether you have fine-grained or coarse-grained soils at your site, um, the zone where you find the elm apple, is it saturated zone or unsaturated zone, and then what type of LNAPL? Is it a low volatility, low solubility, or is it a high volatility, high solubility LNAPL? So um, since our site was mainly a fine grain site, even though LNAPL was, in, um, was mainly in the um, higher permeability soils, most of the site is a fine grain. So if we look at the geology here, we can see that some of these um, technologies are not recommended for um, are not recommended for fine grain. They, they work better in a coarse grain site, at a coarse grain site. So we were able to go ahead and eliminate skimming and total liquid extraction from further consideration. All right, so it sounds like you made a good decision to eliminate skimming and total liquid extraction based on the geologic factors. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you reevaluated your LCSM at this point. Uh, you know, we certainly don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Uh, you know, and doing this will add that extra layer of comfort to, to ensure that we're, we're being protective. Um, so the next step in the technology screening process, uh, what was your LCSM, or Joanne, did you find that your LCSM was thorough enough to move forward with the three remaining uh, remediation technologies? All right, so this is a good time, again, to refer to the LNAPL guidance. Um, if you are um, working on your remedy selection, so Section 4.4 of the guidance has some key questions uh, at this point in our investigation. And those questions range from some fairly general topics to more LNAPL-specific topics. So some questions focus on the source, such as where is it and how is it distributed above and below the water table. Um, but it also includes some other questions, such as what's achievable for a certain for a given technology. So after reviewing these questions, we determined that at this stage, um, looking at continuing with remedy selection, that we did not need to collect any additional field data to move forward. Um, we had already completed two LAF investigations in addition to soil and groundwater and um, utility hand auger investigations. So we had quite a bit of data and all that we needed at this point. Um, some of the elements of the LCSM that were um, that are important for remedy selection at this point, some of the information that we did have, 
um, knowing the permeability was low at the site, and then also knowing that our Ellen Apple source, uh, quite a bit of it submerged below the water table. Okay, so now step three in the selection process will be to screen the remaining possible technologies that you had from step one using those geologic factors in that A-series table uh, located back in Appendix A. Um, so were you able to narrow down your list of the three technologies uh, based on the additional site geologic factors? All right, so referring to those tables at this point um, can be really helpful if you, you may just want be curious about specific technologies. Um, if you're continuing in this process, then we can use these um, tables to look at additional geologic factors. So here's an example of the A-series table for vacuum enhanced skimming. Um, so the top is slightly condensed from the, from the actual table so we can see it. But one thing that you can see is each of these tables for the, each technology, there's a technology section, there's a remediation process section that talks about how the process can be applied um, for specific types of remediation. There's an objective applicability section, and then there's the applicable LNAPL type. Um, so that's, for, that's on each of the tables for each technology. Then at the bottom of the table, we have the geologic factors. And that is separated into the saturated and unsaturated zones. For each of those zones, we have um, information on how it applies uh, to different permeability, grain size, heterogeneity, and consolidation. All right, so in our case, the information um, at this stage, the, the information that was um, beneficial for our screening process was about the saturated zone permeability. So if we take a closer look at that, um, then what we see is that from the tables, the description tells us that um, vacuum enhanced skimming is more successful in higher permeability soils. So as I mentioned, Elm Apple at the site is in the higher permeability lenses, but most of the site has lower permeability soil. So based on this, we determined that vacuum enhanced skimming was not a good fit for our site. Um, and then you'd want to repeat this same process and the, going through the geologic screen for any other technologies. So we had two other technologies to go through that were on our short list. Um, so looking at excavation and multi-phase extraction, we decided that they, based on this information, they were both still applicable to our site. So we continue to consider these two technologies. All right, so, you know, if only one technology had been left after the, this per, preliminary screening, uh, you'd really want to go back and reevaluate your site goals and objectives. Uh, it, you know, and if you still only had one technology, the, the next evaluation uh, might be used to identify any of those showstopper concerns before moving forward with that technology. Um, so this step will involve further evaluation of the technologies remaining in your short list using evaluation factors in table 6-4 and, and now moving forward with that B series table. So here are the nine evaluation factors included in table 6-4 and the next step in the process involves reviewing these factors and ranking the top four to six uh, of these based on your site considerations. Then, then you use that B-series table to compare the technologies. So here's the example from table 6-4 for site restrictions. Uh, table 6-4 defines each evaluation factor and gives general examples of possible impacts uh, to selecting a particular technology. So what, what evaluation factors uh, were, were important for this site that we're discussing? All right, so for this site, these are the four evaluation factors that we decided were the um, most important to consider at this stage, um, the re remedial time frame, site restrictions, waste stream management, and safety. And this was the priority that we gave them. 
So the remedial time frame was because of the priority cleanup status by the regulatory agency. So we just wanted to keep that in mind as we moved along in the process. Um, site restrictions. So this site had no easy sewer connections. Um, we were going to have to do digging to connect to a sewer. There were no nearby manholes or anything to give us an easy connection. Um, there was also no three-phase power nearby, which would be, um, some of these would be needed for multi-phase extraction if we wanted to con continue to consider that. Um, also, we had a lot of underground utilities um, in the area and in the area of the Elm Apple body. Waste stream management was a consideration, something we needed to consider because we knew that with a small site, um, we would not be able to handle large wastewater volume. Um, with the no sewer connections, we had to keep that in, into, uh, take that into consideration. And then also safety was an issue. Um, it is a small site, but it was an active filling station. It is adjacent to a highway. And then with the convenience store there, there is also foot traffic um, because of the, with it being adjacent to the residential area and the apartment. So the B series table um, back in Appendix A gives specific impacts of each of the nine evaluation factors for each remedial technology. And in this example for excavation, we see the site restrictions is a high concern. Um, and there's a discussion giving details to consider. All right, so we did use, um, looking at the, the B series table, one way that you could continue at this point um, is to look at, I think it's our arrow here, to look at, um, here's the evaluation factors that we were considering for the site, and here's the two technologies that we had remaining at the site. Um, so this is a good way to use the B-series table to get it all in one place. It would be a good way to, if you need to have some conversations with regulatory agency or other stakeholders, um, to help explain how you move forward with choosing your um, technologies, or it could just be good for um, to organize your thoughts as to how you would move forward at this point. So we started uh, this process. So from the B-series table, you can add the, um, the concern factor, whether it's low, moderate, or high. So once we had this, we wanted to start with anything that was a high concern at the site. So we knew that the, um, between the site restrictions that we had and the waste stream management, we had, um, these are both high concerns for our excavation. Um, and at this site, we have heavy infrastructure in the, in the area of concern. We have the active tank basin, there's the apartment building, um, there's the alley with the utility corridor, and there's also an offsite garage really close to the El Napo body. Um, so even though the remedial time frame did have a low, um, that time frame is low, which was something that was a, um, important, we decided that there were too many high concerns for excavation. So that was eliminated from our consideration. Um, so then we still want to look at the, any technologies you have left. So multi-phase extraction, there were no high concerns for that. They were all uh, moderate level. So we did retain that for further consideration. Um, if that had had uh, too many high considerations, then we would have needed to circle back around, maybe reevaluate some technologies or LCSM and um, go through the process again. Yep, and so the next step is to review the LCSM based on the design and those performance metrics provided in the C-series table for the technologies that are still being considered. Uh, the LCSM for a site must include knowledge related to the metrics if the technology is actually going to be employed at the site. So let's look at an example of the design and performance metrics for that C-series table uh, for MPE. Uh, examples of design metrics include you know, the number of extraction wells, um, conveyance piping, examples of performance metrics will include your groundwater, your L and apple recovery rates and volumes. Uh, 
this information related to the data requirements and metrics are going to be part of the LCSM, uh, since this, these will need to be part of the full-scale design and then measured to show that MPE was actually successful at your site. So was it necessary for you to update the LCSM for MPE uh, to still be considered? All right, so this is a good time to go back to the guidance document again, um, looking at the questions in the design and performance LCSM section. So in sec 6.4.1, um, we can use these questions to see if, you, if we needed to update our LCSM. In addition to that, answering these questions along with determining metrics and endpoints also helps us to start developing SMART objectives for our site. Um, and so here's a couple of example questions from that section. What are the conditions to be created by the selected technology that will accelerate own apple depletion? So in our case, um, we knew that lowering the water table at the site was one condition that we wanted um, and needed to obtain since a lot of the own apple was in the saturated zone. Uh, another question is what conditions will demonstrate the desired own apple changes? So here it's important to consider endpoints for your technology implementation. So in our case, um, our endpoints included reduced LNOPL occurrence in the monitoring wells and also uh, declining dissolved phase contaminant concentration. So we already had a lot of site information that was necessary to implement MPE technology, such as the depth to the bottom of the LNOPL zone, which would be our dewatering target. Um, but our LCSM was missing information such as the uh, radius of influence of the dewatering that would be needed for MPE implementation. All right, so the next step in the process is to review the minimum data requirements and the critical technology evaluation that's, that's needed for any remaining technologies uh, using the C-Series table, of course, back there in Appendix A. Um, here's the example of the C-Series table for multi-phase extraction. Uh, examples of these minimum data requirements for MPE include determining hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity, uh, your LNAPL conductivity and transmissivity, and LNAPL characteristics. Um, so there's critical technology evaluation information. Uh, includes necessary bench tests and pilot tests, and all the information can be considered uh, so you can further evaluate your technology. Basically, if no technology is left after the further evaluation, uh, the objectives and goals should be reevaluated. You know, you're always circling back to that. Um, so for, for this case study we're discussing, there was only one technology left prior to reviewing the C-Series table, MPE. So what did you do at this point? All right, so in order to continue looking at the information that we needed, um, we knew at this stage we needed to do a pilot test to gather the additional information um, following the C-Series table and to update our LCSM. So this included determining the radius of influence and also recovery rate. Um, this information, in, order, um, in addition to gathering this information, the pilot test would also indicate how well MPE was going to work at the site um, and also the number of wells that would be needed. So during the, in order to complete the pilot test, we had to work with the city to have three phase power installed for the pilot test. But this, the pilot test did show that MPE should be success, successful at the site. So before implementing a technology, this guidance recommends establishing those SMART objectives and performance matrix. Um, the guidance recommends starting to think about uh, the, this end process from reviewing and updating the LCSM uh, for design and performance. So it's also important to monitor the remediation technology and constantly assess performance during the implementation. So you don't just want to get it out there and say, okay, we're done. You want to keep continue to monitor it while it's actually running. And then to demonstrate that your objectives are met. So how are you going to determine performance and success at, at your site? All right, so before we implemented MPE, we knew that system sampling was going to be necessary to monitor the system performance. Um, 
to show that objectives had been met, metrics were the metrics that we established were um, inclu included decline curve analysis and also groundwater contaminant concentration decline. Um, since the site was small, the Ellen Apple body was relatively small, and again, time was of essence for our cleanup. So we decided to run a mobile MPE system 24-7 um, at the site instead of installing a full-scale MPE system. So we knew that the, um, the best option for discharge water was to treat it and discharge it to a nearby storm drain. So we did have to obtain an MPDES permit. Um, we also knew that we would not be remediating all the Ellen Apple at the site. So our treatment train would include natural source zone depletion to treat any Ellen Apple contamination remaining at the site. And after MPE, so um, here's some results from running the MPE system at the site. And so these are for um, gasoline range organics, grow concentration. So just some examples of the, um, the dissolve phase changes at the site. So MW1 and MW4. Um, so on here, you can see when Ellen Apple, uh, the time period when Ellen Apple was observed in each of the wells, um, system operation time. So you can see that the um, dissolve phase GRO contamination in MW4 increased soon after Ellen Apple appeared in that well. Um, once the MPE system was fully operational, we began conducting monthly system site visits in addition to quarter, our normal quarterly monitoring to collect system operation samples and monitor the system and, um, performance. So we noticed that the um, GRO contaminant, contamination concentrations decreased during system operation um, but we did continue to monitor the site for two years after we, um, after system operation was stopped. So El Napple was no longer observed in the wells, and then when we, um, the system was shut down based on decline curve analysis, which indicated that the system was no longer removing contamination efficiently. Um, during the two years of additional monitoring that we, um, that we performed. We saw that the GRO contaminant levels and other dissolved phase contaminant levels, I'm just showing the one here, remained low during this follow-up monitoring, and Ellen Apple was no longer observed in the monitoring wells. Um, so based on those uh, conditions, as well as the decline curve analysis that we had set up prior to implementation, um, the regulatory agency did close the site. All right. Well, thanks for running through the case study and, and you know, showing a real example of how this uh, Ellen Apple guidance document can be applied and used at a site. So here, here are the takeaways from the technology selection process. You need a, that robust LCSM, decide concerns and goals up front. Uh, the technology framework, it's a systematic framework. Uh, you're repeat the process for each concern and goal, and you want to find technologies that overlap with multiple concerns and goals, and then sequence the technologies as appropriate, um, and establish those performance matrix to know what your actual success looks like at the site. So here's, I believe, our last knowledge check during the technology remediation selection process. When should the LCSM be reevaluated and choose all that apply? All right, so A and L CSM should be developed prior to starting the remedy selection process, B during the preliminary screening process, C after further screening with the evaluation factors, and D after remediation if unsuccessful. It looks like pretty much everybody's figured it out. All of the above is the answer, selecting all of them. So, all right, everybody's paying attention. All right, we'll go ahead and move forward with the next slide and start to close this out.
think that'd be right. Okay, so, you know, basically close this out here, where you've been, where you're going. Uh, part one, so that science, connecting the science and the El LNAP will management. Part two, building that conceptual site model. Part three, which you just went through, you know, actually selecting a remedial technology uh, based on what you know and, and what you've learned. And the last thing is you, you know, go back, read the document, work through some stuff, sites on your own, what you can tell other people, you know, increasing your own knowledge uh, to move forward with, with helping you at, at sites that you may have with LNAPL's concerns. And then with that, I will turn it back over to Tadbeer, and thanks everybody for coming out. Thanks so much, Justin. Uh, at this time, we'll have another question and answer period. Remember, you can type your question in the Q&A pod in the bottom right corner of your screen. Before we get to your questions, I'm going to pull up a poll question for you to fill out. Uh, also, the Clue In training page will remain active in case you'd like to access it at a later time. We'd like to hear back from you today, so please be sure to fill out the online feedback form that's linked on this last, on this last slide. You can also access the feedback form by clicking Feedback in the Related link section and then clicking Browse to. Filling out the feedback form and certifying that you participated will allow you to receive a certificate of completion. So with that said, we'll move on to a few questions. And remember, it is pound six to unmute if you're on the phone line. We'll start with you guys. Okay, hearing none. We'll go to the questions in the Q&A pod. Um, do you know why GRO concentrations rebounded at MW1 after system operations stopped? Sorry, I had to get unmuted there. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think it's surprising that after the system operations stopped it to see a little bit of a rebound before it stabilized. Um, during system operation, we're, we're pulling out um, water and vapor and LNAPL. Um, all of those phases were being pumped out of the, the well. So we were removing a lot of water in the LNAPL, and MW1 is right where the release occurred. Um, and we knew that, that when we install the recovery well, we can't get right at the source area because that was an active tank basin. So we were not right um, in the source area, the direct source area uh, where the release occurred. So um, likely that, you know, we knew that there was still going to be some El Napple in that area. So it's not surprising that the grow concentration rebounded some afterwards. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, did you use any other methods besides LNAPL depth and monitoring wells to deter delineate the size of the plume? All right, that's a good question. Um, so hopefully um, it, um, I, I'm glad to clear that up because we did not actually use LNAPL depth in the wells at all to determine the plume. Um, I mean, knowing that there's LNAPL in the wells does give us some idea of the plume but the plume was really based on the LIF investigations. Because um, the, the, the LNAPL body includes both mobile, any potential mobile LNAPL, as well as residual LNAPL. And the residual LNAPL, you can't see that, you know, you can't figure out where that is just looking at LNAPL in the well. Um, so that LIF in investigation was really important to help us determine the depth of the LNAPL um, as well as the uh, uh, horizontal extent. So we get vertical and horizontal extent of the LNAPL. Thanks for that answer. Was there a public concern that monitoring for two years might not be enough? If so, how did you address these concerns? Was, public, was the public involved throughout the process? 
the public was um, was involved to some degree. Um, we did we did not have any concerns. So at this site for this date, we do have to inform the public um, mainly. Well, the public is informed of things occurring because we do um, we do some preliminary questions around. Um, people knew that we were checking basements. We did have do some soil gas investigations um, off-site into residential properties. So people did know that they, you know, needed to inform us if they had any concerns or any issues. Um, we never had anything like that. There were never any vapor or concerns. And um, anytime anyone did have a couple, there were a couple of times people were slightly concerned about what they were seeing in their sump pumps, um, which never turned out to be any LNAP hole. Um, so that, so yes, they were involved in the process to some degree for the people that were the uh, mainly adjacent, the closest adjacent properties to the site. Um, and then once we had decided that the site was remediated to the degree necessary, then the public was um, informed that the site was being closed. So um, there were never any other concerns after that. Good question. Is performance based solely on dissolved phase constituents? Any soil data post-treatment? We did not have any soil data after the treatment, no. We just were looking at um, we were just looking at dissolved phase and then basing it on the decline curve analysis from the um, from running the system. What percentage LIF was indicative of NAPL and how did you determine, especially over multiple phases of investigation? Hmm. I do not know that I remember exactly the percentages. Um, gasoline in in silty clay type soils can be fairly low. Um, that is going to show up lower than like a, a diesel in a sand. It's going to have much higher LIF response, a percent RE. Um, I don't remember exactly what the lower level was. It might have been five percent uh, RE if you're familiar with LIF logs. It possibly could have been lower because um, I don't remember what those levels were right now. Um, and then we did multiple phases of investigation. Um, in the second phase, in the area that was down gradient closer to MW4, um, we, we compared the logs, the earlier logs from the first investigation to the second one. And we did not see those logs had been um, there was no indication of L maple down gradient near MW4 at all in those logs. So just from comparing, you know, having an L maple response to no response was how we determined that the um, that L maple had migrated. Thank you. Um, we have a clarification question. Question: uh, The speaker just referred to a technology used to determine ex to determine extent of L maple plume. I didn't quite hear. Was it LIX? Could you briefly describe? Okay, and it looks like the person did figure out what I was saying. So LIF, laser induced fluorescence. In case anyone else was um, didn't hear that very quickly. I do say that pretty fast. So laser-induced fluorescence is uh, is a good technology for determining the extent of an l maple plume. So that's um, one, one option for doing that at a site. All right, uh, it seems we have no more questions in the Q&A pod. Does anyone on the phone lines want to ask a question? Uh, again, it's pound six to unmute.
Uh, Bear, I see one other question if no one else um, comes up with one. There is one in the further up in the Q&A pod that is probably a good one to get to. Um, which one are you referring to? So, I'm, so someone asked, um, they said on slide 81 seems to suggest that migration, migration to MW4 during low water table um, which is it, which is exactly what we were thinking occurred. Um, and why does that happen? And I, the the full question isn't complete. Why does that happen? And um, maybe a little bit more about what what happens when with the high water table. So in times of at, at site, depending on your the geology at the site, when the water table drops. Um, Sometimes when, the, when El Napol is submerged below the water table, um, if there isn't enough of an El Napol head or a force with the El Napol, it cannot overcome the water that's within the, um, the pore space in, your, in the soil. So, um, so it won't move. It may be, it's almost like it's trapped there because there's, there's no longer an El Napol head if it's not a current uh, release that's occurring. So once the water table drops, those pore spaces open up, and it doesn't take as much for um, El Napol to move in the pore spaces. So in this case, if the soil lenses um, appear to be sort of a um, sort of a downward movement of the soil of the sandy lenses, where the El Napol was, where it's easier for the El Napol to migrate. Um, so it looks like it's just following the geology and the sand lenses down once that once the water table drops. Um, when the high water table, when the water table would come back up to higher conditions, then we would no longer eat, we would actually El Napol from MW4 was like it disappeared. We would not see it in the well. Um, so even right around the well, it was would not be mobile during the high water table. Um, once it dropped again, we would see it in the well. So that's, that's one reason it makes it hard to determine if El Napol was actually migrating at the time of the investigation or if it's something that occurred previously because it could have previously already been existing in the formation and just be showing up as the water table dropped and then disappearing as the water table increases again. Are there less expensive alternatives to LIF? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's the, uh, you know, there are, there are ways to look at El Napol, um, at El Napol if you're looking at collecting soil samples, um, some other people can chime in too. You know, things like MIP, um, MIP is still going to be uh, comparable to LIF and maybe a little bit more expensive. Um, I think I think a lot of people are starting to think about LIF and some of the those advanced site characterization characterization technologies, they may seem expensive up front, but the amount of information that you can get in such a short period of time, um, you can get quite a bit of data in just a couple of days. So you're not looking at lab costs, you're not looking at waiting two, three, four weeks for results to come back before you can start to make some decisions. So, um, so those are you know, so there there are some other ways to look at that instead of thinking of it as a really expensive <clears throat> alternative. Um, you know, it's it's important to think about what data you need and how quickly you need it, and um, what you need to do with the data. Okay. Well, thank you for your questions today, and thank you to our trainers for providing answers. If you need further clarification on the answers or would like to ask more questions, please feel free to email us at training training at itrfeweb.org, and we will follow up with our trainers to get you your questions answered. Uh, or you're welcome to follow up with the trainers directly. Thank you to our expert trainers for being here today and for their contribution to the ITRC document. And, and special
special thanks to our participants. We, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Remember, we do archive our classes, so if you would like to watch it again, you can feel free to do so on Cluin. Uh, we hope you will come back and join us for future ITRC training. The full training schedule can be found on ITRC's website as well as on Cluin. And finally, the ITRC 25th anniversary annual meeting is coming up and registration is open. So register now to get